Me too. Imagine you are sitting in a plane. It's, uh, you can't sleep for some reason, although the in-flight movie is boring like always. And close to you is one of our students. So now imagine you have to tell him or her your life. Where would you star start and how would you do it? Okay, well, I'll start, I'll start by uh, being born. Um, I was born in London in the 1960s. Um, I spent pretty much all my life there, uh, apart from a little brief trip out to America as a child and a brief you know, uh, period where we lived in Wales. But um, uh, I mainly grew up in East London um, in the 60s, 70s, which was quite a sort of racist um, area at that time. In fact, it still is to some degree. Um, and jumping forth to my musical career, um, I, uh, <laughs> after, after being born, I, I became a DJ. Um, and, um, okay, when I was at school, I, I was very interested in music. I was part of the school choir, the school orchestra, uh, the school marching band. I learned to play trumpet. Uh, I was also asked to then play tuba because I was told I had big lips. And um, uh, I taught myself to play guitar and uh, piano. Uh, I didn't get my first record player till I was about 11. I had to really beg my dad for a record player, please, please, please. Finally got this record player. The first record I bought was uh, a track called Darling by David Cassidy. <laughs> um, and so began my, my musical, uh, you know, origins. Um, when growing up, I really wanted to be an artist, a, a painter. Um, and I went to art school. I went to Chelsea School of Art when I was 18. Um, and it was while I was a student that I started to go clubbing um, and uh, somehow thought that I could do better than some of the DJs I was seeing in various clubs that I was in. Um, and that, that's how my DJ career began. At one of the clubs I was going to, they got rid of all their DJs suddenly. Um, and I said, hey, can I have a go? And they said, all right then. And I ended up being resident at that club for the next six years. Um, and somehow, I think my painting, the creativity that went with my painting, my art side, somehow got transferred over into DJing. So it started off as a hobby, but uh, uh, 17 years on, it's a profession. Um, there's a potted history. Fine. I mean, the, the flight might go on for another 11 hours, but uh, we can still switch topics. I think there is a busload of serious things, of course, that uh, I want to talk to you um, about. But I think before we come to the what and the why, uh, it's always uh, kind of interesting for the people to know who is sitting here. So there is an interesting detail that you said your best feature is the dimple on your bottom. Can you explain this? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted dimples on my face and uh, unfortunately my, my younger brother, who's nine years younger than me, got them and I didn't. Um, but I think it was some years later that someone pointed out that I actually had a dimple on one of my buttocks. Um, so it just kind of ended up in the wrong place. But it has <laughs> no relevance or no bearing, no connection with the music side of what I do. But it can be found uh, when you're Googling on the internet uh, under the name of DJ Ritu. There's all kinds of weird things under Google <laughs> under, under the name of DJ Ritu. And none of it's been put up by me. So <laughs> You also said your uh, biggest inspirations are mum and dad. Now, that's really f interesting because, I mean, if I would think, if my father would be my biggest inspiration, I would have become a fisherman, you know, or filming documentaries about springboks in the, uh, in the jungle. Um, but no music, you know. Did your parents inspire you musically or do you mean that spiritually? I think my parents have inspired me in terms of, well, more spiritually and also... I guess the work ethic is, is very, very strong with my parents. And what I'm very conscious of is, I mean, I'm second generation Asian, but they are obviously first generation. They came from India to the UK uh, in the late 1950s, early 60s. And it was very, 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 very difficult for them. Um, you know, they, being a, a, a country that was formerly, you know, a colony, um, many people in India and some of the other colonies, ex-colonies, um, will have regarded the UK as being, you know, the place to get the best education. You know, everything that was English was the best, best thing. Uh, and, of course, all these people went over there to work and then found, you know, signs up on boarding houses saying no coloreds, no dogs, no Irish, 
know this, know that, know that. My father went to, uh, one year he went to Trafalgar Square for the New Year's Eve celebrations uh, as a young man. He must have been about 20, 25, something like that. And he, you know, he was punched in the face and whatever just for, just for, being, just for being Indian. Um, so I suppose in that sense that my parents have been very inspirational because what I've seen them do is I've seen them struggle and I've seen them work very hard and not complain. Um, and, uh, you know, I, th I suppose some of my, a lot of my strength actually comes from them. Um, and to this day, I mean, they're, they're remarkably liberal. They're, they're very uh, encouraging about what I do. They weren't at first, I hasten to add. Um, I was kind of regarded as the black sheep of the Indian community that I grew up in in the UK because I didn't want to be a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant. And... Um, uh, but once I, once I started presenting for the BBC, um, that's when my parents then felt that, you know, this was something they could identify with. It, was, uh, it had status. Um, and so that's why, you know, since then, they've, they've been much more sort of, okay, we understand what you do now, and, it, and it's all right. So the, the <coughs> I, think, I, I, suggest, I suppose that uh, this uh, possibility of doing the radio show for BBC was like one of the big milestones in, uh, in your career. Your first show has this very interesting title called Bangra in Bats. How did you come to this, uh, this title? Is it played in the morning where everybody is still sleeping or why Bangra in Bats? Okay, um, out of the radio shows that I've done and do do, uh, none of them have been titled by me. Um, the show I do currently is for the National BBC Asian Network and it's called The Mix, <laughs> which is not a title I would have chosen. Um, I've, I've also presented two series on uh, Asian music to, for the BBC World Service, uh, and that was titled Bhangra Beat. And um, Bhangra in Beds, which was the first radio show that I started doing, which was for BBC Three Counties Radio. At that time, it was called BBC Radio Bedfordshire, um, covering the county of Bedfordshire in the UK. And the short version of Bedfordshire was Beds, so there was a program called Breakfast in Beds and bloody blah, and so my program came to be called Bhangra in Beds. Okay, no, no sexual connotation or whatever. None whatsoever. Okay, no mattress member. <laughs> um, then, okay, that was 92. So wh what was the next big step in your career? I turned 28, and literally a week later, one, my six-year res residency that I mentioned before suddenly went. You know, I, I looked in the magazine and found that some other people were DJing in my residency the following week. <laughs> uh, and within the next year, all my DJ residencies went. So I kind of thought, well, maybe I'm not supposed to DJ anymore. I actually really thought that. And I, I kind of struggled to get work for uh, quite a few months. You know, I'd have the odd gig here and the odd gig there, but nothing regular. And um, it was because of that that I moved into radio. Um, and uh, just kind of sent a demo tape off to the BBC. Um, you know, it was a terrible demo tape, absolutely terrible. Um, but they liked my voice and they said, yeah, great, you know, come in and we'll have you, sort of thing. Um, and, and it was actually through doing the radio program that I started to meet a lot of different people. And uh, the radio program actually led me to uh, meeting up with uh, a guy called Mitz, who was part of a, a, the first ever Sikh rap outfit. There was these three seat guys, you know, with turbans and everything, and, and they caused quite, quite a, a stir in, in the UK in the early 90s because they, was, they were just so unusual to look at, you know. <coughs> and um, <clears throat> anyway, Mitz, uh, who was one of them, was, was setting up a club uh, in, in conjunction with two of his other student friends. And this club turned out to be the first ever weekly Asian club in the UK, um, possibly even the world, actually, not even just the UK. Uh, it was called Bombay Jungle. It opened at the WAG, um, which was a very well-known sort of uh, mainstream sort of club anyway. Um, and this club was every Tuesday night. And, you know, suddenly Shaftesbury Avenue in central London, just the whole face of it completely changed because suddenly there were all these Asians. Um, and, you know, we used to pack 700 kids into this club and there'd be piles of young people outside who couldn't get in because it was just too full. Um, the media really got hold of it. I mean, we, we had film crews in from Japan and Canada and India and, you know, just everywhere. Um, so it caused a major, major buzz, this club. And, and, and I was fortunate enough to be one of the resident DJs at it. Um, so that was quite a turning point for me. And uh, that, again, sort of led me to, to the formation of Outcast Records. Um, Bombay Jungle opened in 1993. 
uh, Outcast, we founded in 1994. Um, I was being sent records, free records, as you do, you know, from uh, various PR companies. One of the PR companies was, it was a PR company called uh, Heavyweight Media, and uh, they were sending me records by people like Apache Indian, uh, the Ragga Twins, and so on. Um, and the guy that was sending me the records, we ended up talking a lot on the phone, and we talked about how we felt that, um, that the, the, the music industry was basically blocked uh, for Asian talent to come forward. We felt that there were no openings for Asian people in the music industry at all. If you were Asian, you could go and you know, join one of the Bhangra labels and do Bhangra. But what if you didn't want to do that? The only other alternative was Nation Records, which had been set up around 89, 90, 1990. Um, and that was much more about a kind of global chaos fusion thing. Um, so we really felt that there was something missing. There was a big gap, a big gap in the market, a big gap for uh, Asian artists to go to. Um, we also talked about how we felt that, um, uh, that perhaps for people of African uh, or Caribbean descent, um, that certain moves had been made forward in terms of how cool it was to be black um, on the street. Uh, at this time, I was also working as a youth worker. I was managing a youth centre in North London. And what I was seeing there was I was, seeing, I was seeing black kids, white kids, Greek kids, Asian kids, and all the kids wanted to be black, right? They were, they were wearing kind of, you know, hip-hop kind of clothing, talking in kind of urban street, black street language. Uh, they were listening to sort of black street music, so on, so on, so on. Um, <clears throat> and I said to Shabs at Heavyweight Media, wouldn't it be cool if it was... You know, wouldn't it be great if it was cool to be down with the brown? Meaning that maybe through music, maybe we could change something about how Asians were perceived in the UK in terms of the coolness factor. Because at that point, we were definitely not cool. We were the people that were running the corner shops. We were the people that made curry. Uh, we were the doctors. Uh, we weren't regarded as musical. We weren't regarded as sporty. We weren't regarded as, you know, nobody wanted to be like us. And um, so that's kind of how we started Outcast. Uh, was with a specific view uh, to making a lot of social and political changes and not just making music that was equally British and Eastern. And haven't you been surprised yourself by the immediate success of Outcast recordings? It's a surprise now. I think we didn't really feel the fruits of our labours until maybe 96, 97, um, when the Asian underground scene started to be a scene and started to be an industry and started to be something that the mainstream press were writing about and talking about. Um, and we started to see, we started to see a lot, lot of excitement, particularly in Europe. In fact, Europe was far more receptive and far more open um, and far more keen and eager to be hearing this music and hearing the artists far more than the UK was. In the UK, we have to remember the UK has a special, a special relationship with the Indian subcontinent which again goes back to it being, you know, the, the, the former colonies. Um, and so we were constantly battling with this thing of it's not cool to be Asian. <laughs> and the music ain't cool either, right? So now when, when I, you know, look at what's happening now, um, now I can see really, really, really uh, the fruits of our labours and of many other people around us that also worked for the, towards the same goals at that time. <clears throat> if somebody had told me that this year... I would be going around the world and playing Bollywood in places like Belgrade, in Stockholm, uh, in Cairo, in Istanbul. I would have laughed. Two years ago, I would have laughed. I mean, if somebody said to me, yeah, you'll be going around the world playing Asian underground, I wouldn't have laughed because that's been normal for me for the last, you know, eight, nine years. And in fact, another reason why we set up Outcast, one of our other things that was in our mission statement was that we kind of hoped that by making music <clears throat> that was very palatable for Western people, you know, that, that was kind of drum and bass but might have a tabla loop stuck in it or a sitar somewhere, um, that this would be the stepping stone, the first step on the ladder uh, for non-Asians to access Asian music. Um, and we hoped that what would then happen is that non-Asians would then access uh, more traditional forms of music after that. And that didn't happen in the 90s, but it seems to be happening now. You have found a very interesting way of uh, 
kind of broaden the spectrum of a work of a DJ with your project Sister India by adding uh, visual, uh, visual uh, elements, dancers, rappers. Could you briefly introduce to us uh, how that happened? What was your basic idea with Sister India? The band that, that I had before Sister India was called The Asian Equation. Um, and that was created by accident. Um, basically, I was, I was DJing in uh, Brussels and a promoter that was there came over to me and said, listen, I love what you do and every year I hold an annual live music uh, six-week thing in, in Berlin. It's actually Heimatklanger. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> and I'd really like you to come and perform there, but DJs are very boring to look at. Um, I said, thank you. And, um, and so he, he basically gave me a budget and he said, go and do something with this, with this money. So um, what I decided to do was I called upon various musician friends of mine and I thought, well, okay, well, they don't look boring. Even if I look boring, they don't. So um, I kind of tried to devise a way of, of working with these guys and it, it was all guys, actually. Just I was the only, pretty much the only woman there. Um, <coughs> and we went off to Berlin and did these five shows. So Asian Equation just suddenly, it just took a life of its own. It just kind of, you know, uh, snowballed. Um, and then I think maybe about two years later, 1998, around then, I started to get a bit serious about it, and I realized that I really was enjoying what I was doing with it, because um, now I wasn't this only person, this solitary person DJing. I, I was collaborating with other people. There was a creative exchange going on, um, and I found that it actually brought out my performance aspects. You know, normally, when I've been DJing, you know, I, I'm in a little booth, and I, I'm kind of there, and I, I've got my headphones on, and, and I'm like this, you know, and the foot's tapping away like this, you know. And the, um, whereas with, with Asian Equation, I found that I could suddenly come out of myself a little bit more, you know. So it brought out the performer in me to some degree as well. Along the way, I kept meeting um, quite interesting Asian women who were musicians, you know. Like, there was a woman called uh, Sudha, who you'll see on the DVD in a minute, who was actually, a, she's a Latin percussionist, and she works with Faithless. Um, and she was also resident at uh, clubs like the Hacienda in Manchester, Cream in Liverpool, Ministry of Sound in London. And then there was another woman called uh, Jyoti, who was an Indian woman. She was playing uh, violin for people like Joan Armour Trading, uh, Ryushi Sakamoto, uh, excuse my pronunciation, uh, Reggae Philharmonic Orchestra. She was working with you know, a lot of top people. Anyway, so these women were kind of dotted around and they were in the background, they were like session musicians or, you know, uh, just background people in various bands and clubs and what have you. And I kept thinking, what would it be like to take an all-female, all-Asian female team? You know, what would, what, what would it be like if Asian Equation was not all guys, but was all women? You know, how would that be? What kind of energy would that create, you know? And uh, anyway, we applied for a grant and we got it. And that's how we created Sister India, as an all-Asian female equivalent of the Asian equation. This is apparently a, a really well-done uh, blend or fusion of um, Indian elements and uh, very up-to-date uh, rhythms and uh, parts of, uh, let's say, Western uh, club culture. This. Uh, attitude is quite opposed to that of those uh, elderly gentlemen yesterday who were very very conservative uh, clinging to the old production values of the 60s and 70s you know as the one and only valid formula um, how come uh, you and uh, your partners are so open-minded um, good qu I think it's probably the dimple on the, on the bottom that's probably had, has a lot to do with it. I mean, if you have a dimple on your bottom, you have to be really open-minded afterwards. I see myself as someone who is here to entertain. Um, and I, I'm a firm believer that if people come to my gigs or come to my clubs or whatever, um, that they are paying money and that my job is to entertain them. Um, and that, I think, fits straight away hand in hand with having an open approach because you, you have to be saying, well... Uh, let me come to you. What can I do for you? You're saying that, aren't you? Yeah, you're, you're, you're aiming to please, aiming to, aiming to, uh, aiming to provide something um, or provide something that's being asked for. If we come back to the, the, the political implication of music um, and uh, your role as an ambassador between two cultures, 
I, I suppose that uh, if you want this effect that people say, hey, it's cool to be down with the Asian, you can't be a hard, hardcore uh, uh, playing traditional Asian music because then the, the Western guys will never get it. And on the other hand, if you would be just a regular drum and bass DJ, you would do nothing for uh, the Asian community. So this was probably the best, uh, the best formula. Well, this, this is one of the formulas. I mean, the Sister India formula is kind of, it's, it is fusion-y. It is, it, it is what some people would term as Asian underground. Um, though we, in fact, like to describe ourselves as a club music-based band. We're, 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 bas we're basically a club on stage uh, with a whole kind of visual show and whatever. But with the clubs that I run, um, okay, let's take Kuch Kuch, for example, which is, it was the first uh, Bollywood club opened in London. We opened that three years ago in 2000. Um, and um, there I am playing pretty hardcore traditional Asian music from the Indian film industry, Bollywood, uh, and also Bhangra, uh, uh, which is pretty traditional. So it's definitely not what you've just heard on the DVD at all, quite different. But there, what I would do there uh, is, is I will mix it up with r and I'll mix it up with house. But I think what we're seeing now is we're seeing a, we're seeing a coming of age of British Asians. We're seeing, we're seeing um, a movement that can't be stopped any longer <clears throat> and, and is filtering out and out and out and becoming more and more mainstream. Um, I mean, I would pretty much bet that most of you, or a lot of you are from different countries, but I would imagine that almost all of you have heard of Punjabi MC. Who, who has heard of Punjabi MC? Okay, so most people, I mean, because the track Mundi at the Bachke by him, uh, which went to number five in the British charts in January this year, uh, had already charted in Germany. It went to number two in Germany before Christmas. Um, it was playing in Turkey when I was there in September last year. Um, so it's, it's kind of gone into the top five or top ten or almost every country in the world, you know. And that is just... An amazing thing, absolutely amazing thing. Do you also have a, a typical example of Bangra here? I've got three typical examples of Bangra here, and there's probably a fourth type that I, I didn't bring with me, which is a shame. So I'm going to give you three, three types. Um, if we start with the first, um, that would be a very, a very traditional form of Bangra, much more how it would be done in India itself as opposed to in its fusion world or in its diasporic world in the UK or the States or Canada or wherever. Okay, so here we go. That one's actually a very nationalistic piece as well. It's, it's one of those ones, if you're DJing in an Asian club, you will get, you know, kind of a lot of Punjabis coming over and saying, play that track, can you play this track for me, Up Up Punjab, it's about our Punjab, i.e. the part, the part of India that is Punjab, northern, northern India. It also is in Pakistan as well. Punjab was actually divided by the partition of um, Pakistan and India. So Punjab falls, the region of Punjab falls in both. And Bhangra music is Punjabi. It's not Gujarati, it's not Sri Lankan, it's, it is Punjabi. And the lyrics are sung in the Punjabi language. They are sung in Punjabi. And nine times out of 10, in fact 99 times out of 100, it will be sung by a guy. There, there won't be, there's not women, there are very few women on that, in, in that music, in that scene. Is Punjabi MC also a second generation uh, Punjabi? Yeah, he is, and his real name's Raj. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he, he's, from Birmingham, he's from Birmingham, yeah, and, uh, but yes, he is Punjabi. What are the typical uh, Bhangra dance moves then? Bhangra music originates, as we say, from the Punjab. It is a folk music, um, and really, it was largely created around, uh, for the spring, for the harvest of, um, of uh, you know, uh, vegetables and the, the corn and what have you. Um, and the main drum that is used in Bhangra music is the big uh, double-sided drum that's uh, it's put around the neck and beaten with sticks. And it's called the dol. Okay, so you will hear that over and over again in Bhangra music. And the dol is very much a dance drum. It's very much about, you know, chukka, 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 come and dance, come and dance. It's really loud, it's brash, you know, very sort of brash sort of drum. <laughs> You can hear it's British produced because there's a bee line for starters. You know, like the first one we heard, which is Indian produced, bass line's not that important, you know. Quite often it'll almost be missing, you know, and, and you, you're 
you know, quite often having to turn up the bass on your, e on your graphic equalizer, you know, to sort of just get something there at the bottom end, really, apart from the bass of the drums, whereas the British produced stuff, it will always have a B line, it will have, you know, it will have, the, the, you know, you can hear, obviously, the beats are metronomed or, you know, drum machined or whatever. Um, it just, it feels British, it, do you know what I mean? It's, it's not, it's not Indian produced, you can hear it. And here's something that's very, very British. Um, what's going on at the moment is a very big move towards urban Bhangra at the moment in the UK. Um, and that takes two forms. It tends to be either garage um, or it will tend to be R&B. So on the garage side, you'll tend to get, again, the very strong bass line. Um, uh, you'll tend to have a, a rap, which will be done in English or patois or something of that kind. Um, and then the, the, the singing vocal will be in Punjabi. So how can you pigeonhole Bhangra? You've heard three very different things there. Um, and then if you add the Punjabi MC into that as well, that's four different things. So, so there's, there's a lot going on with the music, a lot going mu on with the music. And I think the only thing that really unifies it is the fact that, as I say, um, there will be some lyrical content uh, which is sung in Punjabi. And that's about the only, th the only common ingredient now going on. Um, the interesting thing with the track like this, for example, is, um, I mean, I, I run DJ workshops um, in various places, and, and uh, some of the schools we've been working in in East London recently. Um, it's been quite phenomenal. Um, you know what I said earlier about being a youth worker and seeing all the kids wanting to be black? And uh, um, schools in East London at the moment, the Asian kids are bringing music like this in, and all the other kids are listening to it, and they're bringing stuff in like this too. So suddenly people are wanting to be brown. Does that make sense? And it's, it's, that's a really big difference that I'm, I'm seeing at the moment. You know, for me to be seeing, you know, white kids listening to this in school with their Asian friends, it's like, yeah, but you can hear why, because it, apart from the fact they can't, they wouldn't be able to understand the Punjabi lyric, everything else in there is fam familiar to them. You know, the, the tempo, the beat, the rhythm, everything, everything is familiar. You already mentioned Dr. Dre and Missy Elliott. Um, we have uh, witnessed that uh, <coughs> big hip-hop artists have been uh, sampling elements of uh, Asian underground stuff or Bangra. So would you be happy about this? Would you say this is another achievement? Even the black now would say, hey, it's cool to be down with the Asians. Or is it just uh, that they uh, need a little bit of exotic toppi topping on their, their production? Um. The, the Asian music industry is very split on this question at the moment. I think we're all very excited to, to suddenly see some progress at last with Asian music becoming more mainstream. But everyone's terrified that it's going to be a fad, a trend, it's going to go and come, uh, come and go as quickly as it arrived, you know. Um, my personal belief is that I don't think it will come and go as quickly as it arrived. I think it will be around to stay for quite a while. Um, the reason being is that uh, uh, if, you went, if you went to, as I say, if you came to Bombay Jungle back in 1993, you would have heard us playing Bhangra, but you would have heard us playing Raga, you would have heard us playing Jungle, you would have heard us playing Swing. Okay, so you would have heard us playing all of those music styles in there. Um, but if you went to a black music kind of club, you wouldn't have heard any Asian music being played whatsoever. So what's been going on in the Asian music scene for years in the UK is we've been having this one-way conversation with black music, and we've been having this one-way conversation with black culture, um, you know, and it's never been the other way. It's never been a dialogue. It's never been a two-way conversation. And now there is a two-way conversation going on. So we had, you know, Missy Elliott, get your freak, get, get your freak on. Uh, Dr. Dre Truth Hurts, Addictive, um, which actually was a bit naughty because um, he sampled, um, I think it was Lata Mangeshko, um, but he didn't get permission from, from, the, uh, from the Indian record company, I think it was EMI India, um, and just thought he could get away with, you know, taking this Asian lady's voice and not telling anybody. And EMI India knew that he was about to release this track and da da da, and they sent him letters and phoned him, or phoned his production company and said, look, all we're saying is, you need to clear this sample, you need to pay us for it, and then you can release your track. And he, they just ignored these letters, um, and just went ahead, released the track anyway. Um, 
So when it's done like that, with no respect whatsoever for the artist uh, and for the record company, uh, then that, that I'm not happy about at all. And, I'm, and uh, you know, I think a lot of people weren't very happy about that. And ultimately, if Dr. Dre or Missy Elliott or any of these other people um, are putting Asian music out there, it sends it out to a wider audience than any Asian artist could take it to. If an Asian artist had produced Get Your Freak On, it would not have gotten into the charts. That wouldn't have happened. Whereas Missy Elliott could take it that one step further and to new audiences as well. So now there's a dialogue. The one-way conversation has stopped. There is a dialogue going on. And that's got to mean um, a longer life for Asian music outside of the underground.